Hi, my name is Father Columba, and it's a real privilege to be with you here for the Scottish New Dawn Conference, um, to be asked to, to speak here. I've never, never been to the conference, never gotten to speak before, so it's a great honor for me. So as I said, my name is Father Columba Jordan. I'm a Franciscan of the Renewal. I'm based in Bradford, England now for the last uh, six months or so. Prior to that, I was in Derry, Northern Ireland. And today I wanted to talk to you about, um, about healing, God's amazing gift of healing. So let's say a little prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. God, you are the God who heals. Uh, it is your gift. It's one of the, the central activities that you did when you were on the earth. One of the most visible ones was you did extraordinary numbers of miracles, especially healings. And you then commissioned not only your apostles, but all your disciples to do what you did and to lay their hands on the sick that they would be healed. So Lord, we pray that you will speak to us today about this, not just to talk about this, but speak to us personally. We pray during this talk that you would release a personal word to every person watching this, whenever they are watching it. Our Lady, Spouse of the Holy Spirit, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I was a kid, I had a very serious uh, illness. I got um, double pneumonia. So uh, I only later learned that means <laughs> pneumonia in both lungs. I just figured it was really bad pneumonia at the time. So uh, apparently I, it was very serious. I was in the hospital and almost died or, or um, whatever else. And I had some allergic reactions to medication and all sorts of complications. Anyway, for any of you who are parents or grandparents and have had a sick child before, you know that can be a really very, very difficult, scary time. And it certainly was for my parents. And, um, and you'd kind of do anything for your kids, right? You'd do anything to, to take that illness away from them. And so my parents were just the same. And um, <laughs> it was coming up to Christmas and I was still sick, seriously sick with this. And I got my hands on, uh, on the Argos catalogue. And I, I was sitting up in bed, you know, and I was getting ready for Christmas, getting ready for Santa and all those, that good stuff. And I had the Argos catalog out and the pen. And I'm furiously, you know, circling things and doing tick marks and all sorts of things. I was about 10 at the time. My mother is getting terrified. She, I think she's more terrified about this and the price list than about my, my sickness. So at some point, you know, she very diplomatically, you know, just kind of casually walks into the bedroom and says, so... Uh, you know, <laughs> tries to talk me down from my my uh, begging list. You know, sh mania from from uh, from Santa Claus. You know, she she keeps doing this. You know, keeps trying to talk me down. And, and after a while, I just had enough. And I put the pen down and I look at her. I fold my arms. And I'm like, I don't get it. Is this Christmas or is this Christmas? And for me, that I really meant it. I, you know, it, it, Christmas for me was a time where you know the sky was the limit as big as you can dream, and more, could be yours. You just need to ask big. Um, so Santa Claus is a beautiful uh, image, really, of, of God the Father. And only God the Father can actually do what my, my child, uh, childlike hopes and desires could do. Needless to say, I didn't get all the presents I wanted, but I was very happy on Christmas Day. Um, but God has this... He wants to provide for us like this. He wants to be our, our Santa Claus, you could say. And, and I think there's something inside of us that has this desire for more, and not just you know a little bit more, but enormous, enormously more in our lives. So this, this understanding, this, uh, this attitude actually kind of stayed with me of wanting to see this more. Remember as a teenager, kind of looking at, at Christianity and the Catholicism, quite vibrant Catholicism I'd grown up in. Even you know, my parents were involved in, in the charismatic renewal and I'm wanting more. Hearing about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, hearing about healing, you hear about you know, Sister Breach, McKenna, or different, uh, you know, we go to different conferences and things and they talk about prophecy and they talk about stories. But I didn't, very often actually see miracles in the flesh. I didn't often see, um, I certainly wasn't invited to 
you know, be a protagonist, you know, to do some of this stuff. It was, you know, the special, the specialists on the stage, they did this stuff and somehow or other they got this gift and somehow or other they had this amazing faith that God would do things and God, I guess, just favored them. And that's how I looked at it. So I felt a little included, uh, excluded from getting to do it, but I even felt excluded from seeing it, you know. When Jesus was alive, people just saw him do it, but then he, he opened it up to the whole church and not just the apostles, to the whole church, that the whole church would be and is Jesus' presence on the earth. So just as Jesus worked these incredible miracles and drew crowds and, and you saw the kingdom coming, so too that's every Christian is supposed to be a, a, a contact point between, between earth and heaven. As we pray in the Our Father, and I wonder if that's something of what we are praying for in, in the intention of Jesus. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So these two realities would collide and that you are that point of contact. In every Catholic church, uh, and certainly in the, the old designs of those Catholic churches, the sanctuary is different from the rest, the body of the church that there's supposed to be something of a dividing line, that there is a, a holy space, the whole church is a holy space, but there is a, a holiest space, a holier space. And that the, the, the point of contact, you know, we used to have the, the communion rail and that's when you would come up to receive, receive communion was at this, this point of contact where the sanctuary met the body of the church. And how appropriate that that's where communion would happen. That's where you and Jesus would enter into the, the deepest union um, and it's a very it's a very holy place in the church but it's also um, yeah you are called to be that that bridge not a not a wall a bridge between two worlds between heaven and earth that your life can be the place where people get to encounter the love of God God becoming flesh and we also pray this right in the Angelus. It's the memory of Our Lady being that bridge and where Jesus became flesh. But we pray it for ourselves, you know, that, uh, and the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, that we who receive this Word from God would believe it. Uh, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy Word. She said yes to the Word, she believed it therefore, and that we too would say yes to the Word that God speaks to us each day, that He speaks to us just in general through the Gospel and as, as a Christian. And that we are promised then that the word would become flesh. If you will say yes, if you will believe, there will be this, this contact between these two worlds and Jesus will become present. So I had this desire as a teenager, you know, to, there's supposed to be something more. Where's the power? I was a little disappointed, maybe disillusioned, or at least hungry, uh, hungry that, to see this more, and I wasn't. There's an interesting... Um, study I came across uh, done on the Shroud of Turin. So this is relatively recently uh, done by a group in Italy. They're a, a power research group. So they research different kind of sources of power and uh, like electricity power and ways in which that they could put it to, to work. So they did this uh, study on the Shroud of Turin and uh, it was because they couldn't figure out, like, or they were trying to figure out like how much power did this thing take to make it? Because you may have heard, oh no, it's a, you know, it was made, you know, it was fabrication in the Middle Ages. No, it wasn't a fabrication in the Middle Ages. That's a load of rubbish. Uh, we do not have the technology to accurately replicate what is the Shroud of Turin. Let me say that again. We do not have the technology to accurately replicate what happened and what is the Shroud of Turin. Okay, it's, it's totally unique. It's, it's, it is miraculous, okay? So you're thinking, you know, today's technology is pretty advanced. Surely you could just print it. But no, you couldn't. <laughs> and the experts could tell the difference. And uh, they were talking about these different l types of lasers. So to burn this image onto this cloth without any scorching, without damaging the cloth itself, but to leave this image on there uh, requires 
an incredibly powerful laser. So the, the current most powerful lasers, you know, they were saying to, to do it, and to do it like instantaneously. You know, it's not like, mm, little, let's do the nose first and then let's do the... No, to do this like instantaneous thing, that we don't actually have a laser powerful enough that could do it in such a way as to not scorch it. Um, so they were proposing this other type of laser, but we don't have one that could be powerful enough and big enough to do it. And they calculated that if you were to use this laser, which could get the detail right and could not scorch it, and at the, you would have to, it would have to use 34,000 billion watts of power. 34,000 billion watts of power. Now, I did a rough little bit of research. As far as I know, that is more than all of the power stations in the continental US combined. Okay. And no, no laser like this exists in the world, even if you could take all of those, that electricity and plug it into one huge, think like Death Star laser, okay? We're talking huge. It doesn't exist. Okay. Why am I saying all of this lovely information? Well, firstly, because uh, this is an amazing thing, the, the, the Shroud of Turin, whether you believe it's uh, legitimately the, the cloth that wrapped the body of Jesus and that this, this image that we have left is actually a form of photograph, the first photograph we have in the history of humankind. And it's a photograph of the greatest miracle ever, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, his total victory. Nobody saw it but we actually have a photograph of it, <laughs> according to many, uh, much of the evidence seems to say that way. Well, why am I saying this? Well, I want to, I want to bring your attention to Ephesians chapter 1. Okay, so this is from St. Paul, his letter to one of the earliest churches in Ephesus, the Ephesians. And he says in, in verse uh, 17, he says that he prays in, in verse 16 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the full knowledge of him. And it goes through 18, and then this is 19. Um, basically, that you would know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe, according to the working of his great might, which he accomplished in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Okay, so what he's saying is, I, I want to pray that you get a, a spirit of wisdom and revelation, that you really understand this thing. Uh, and what? You would really, really understand everything you're called to, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power in you? He wants you to know, to get a, a revelation, to get not just revelation, like, oh my goodness, but wisdom, what does wisdom mean? It's practical knowledge. So you could have theoretical knowledge, practical knowledge, knowledge that impacts the way you are and the way you live. That's what St. Paul wants for you. That's not just what St. Paul, that's what the Holy Spirit, that's what the Father and the Son want for you to really know his power, the power which he, by which he raised Jesus from the dead, that it's infinite, that it is immeasurable. 34,000 billion watts is measurable. So he's talking about something even bigger. That was just the poof. That was the flash of the thing. It wasn't the actual miracle. It's just a poof, okay? The actual miracle is something so beyond anything we could ever accomplish on the earth that any human mind could even imagine, as he says later in chapter three. So he wants you to know this power. And, and what about it? That it's inside of you. That's what he says. Uh, it, uh, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe according to the working of his might? So God's infinite power, where is it on the earth? Where is this, this, where is this, this place, this moment of encounter of power? It's, it's in you. It's not in the heart of the sun. It's not in a nuclear power station. It is you, what is inside of you is greater St. John tells us this, it's greater than he was in the world, meaning Satan. And Satan, if the Lord let him, could snuff out the earth like that. And the power inside of you, the Holy Spirit inside of you, the power that raised Jesus from the dead in you is greater than that. It's greater than all of hell. So where's the power? Meaning, back to me as a teenager, why am I seeing this power? Why aren't we seeing the dead raised? Why aren't we seeing the sick healed? We just talk about it, just old stories. 
Oh, I remember back in the 70s, I was at a thing and someone got healed. What about right now? Because Jesus isn't the God of the 1970s. He is, but he's the God of right now. And his power right now is the same power that rose in from the dead. And his power is inside of you if you believe. And he wants, he wants that, the Holy Spirit, that power, that, want, that spirit want, out, wants out. That's what our confirmation is all about. You know, our baptism, we get this, the spirit into us, for us, for sanctification, for communion, for transformation, and sancti- uh, to become truly holy and like Christ. Confirmation is the uncorking of that wine bottle that's been getting better and better and better with age. And then when you're ready for confirmation, it's like the guys when they've won the Formula One and they shake the bottle uh, to unleash the spirit wants out of you all over the world. He wants to pour out on your families, in your businesses, on your friends, uh, to just like a, <laughs> like a, a pot of honey. So my granny had a, when she was getting older, she had the housekeeper, you know, someone who'd come in to help her and clean up. And actually the helper was older than her. <laughs> but it was funny because uh, her, her helper at one point had a tremendous love of marmalade loved her marmalade so she'd be you know making herself marmalade sandwiches or whatever um but she had this funny habit of actually getting it on her fingers and we lived in the same house with my granny at the time and you would find you know you'd open the door and be like oh it's a bit sticky what <laughs> you'd be wondering like what is it? and then the, the you know the butter knife is sticky and the, the fridge and the, and the kettle is sticky <sighs> guess who's been here everything was sticky and if everything you touch becomes sticky then everyone who touches what you touch becomes sticky now that's uh, maybe a funny uh, annoying slightly annoying the habit of one person but uh, this is how we can be in a good sense with the holy spirit that if you've got the holy spirit like your hands covered in marmalade everything you touch every life you touch is going to get a bit sticky with the holy spirit that what is inside of you the one who is the the greatest power in the universe and greater than anything in the universe can start to touch and affect and transform lives simply by being in your presence. Simply by being in your presence. But the key to unleashing this power is faith. The key to unleashing this power that's really in you, that's right now in you, is your faith. That's the, that's the thing that pops the cork. Now, for me, you know, I, 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 because I wasn't seeing power in, in, in the church and in Christianity, for a while I went exploring into the New Age movement. But eventually I had a God encounter, brought, brought me right back to Jesus and, and actually to his, his divine mercy through that devotion and through Sister Faustina, St. Faustina. And um, yeah, so I had this God encounter. And then I, much later I started to experience the power. Well, I guess I, I encountered the power that way, right? The risen Jesus, the living Jesus that you can actually encounter him and meet him isn't that the most amazing thing and that's what all of this like the healing and all that stuff is geared towards bringing people into that ultimate power encounter which is the encounter of jesus in his love leading them into the sacraments and into the heart of the church so so what can we do what can we do to understand this power this faith this unleashing of power in our life and just to make it normal just make it normal. Not a special thing at a conference. Not the 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 privilege of the elite and the, the supposed you know few who are really holy and the rest of us you know schleps. Or we don't know anything. Please tell us, oh wise speaker. Uh, no. Um, well, I mean, I will, I'll share you what what the Lord has done in me. But I, so that you will do what the Lord has for you to do, uh, whatever that might be. Okay. So faith. I used to think faith was an, an impossible leap. So you would have, you know, someone at, at a conference and they're maybe sharing words of knowledge for healing and, uh, or they, they give a prophetic word and they might scare the life out of you with how accurate it is. But it, it was like you either had it or you didn't have it. So I don't know. I thought at some point that, you know, God would appear, to, it must have appeared to them and gave them these gifts, but it's not for everybody. And, and they just seem to be able to make these ridiculous leaps of faith, like jumping up Mount Everest. They don't have to climb. They just suddenly are up the top of Mount Everest. And I, I would kind of look, oh, I can never do that. Um, and I've come to realize faith isn't actually like that. Faith is something that's right now, and it's, it's something that's given to you. 
It's a gift to take the next step in choosing to believe him. That's what it is. It's choosing to believe God, to believe what he has said to you, to believe his word, to believe his gospel, to believe his love. Can you believe that? So I would put all this pressure on myself. It's like, oh, I could never, you know, pray for healing. So I'd pray like, oh, Lord, if it be your will, because, I mean, uh, uh, unless you do something, I can't do anything. So I'd have this, like, escape clause. Lord, heal them if it's your will. Rather, it's like, you know, what, what does God want to do? And, uh, and specifically then, this, this act, this role of faith in that moment, what does that look like? Well, it's not up to you. You can't heal somebody. You can't raise somebody from the dead by your power. Like, go ahead. I welcome you to try that. Uh, I sometimes bring this point up when I talk in my local neighborhood here in Bradford. And get, I get approached by a lot of Muslims who, you know, are trying to make, turn me into a Muslim, um, which hasn't worked so far, thank God. And I've done my best to lead lots of them to Jesus. Um, but often I will, I will challenge them on this. It's like, let's, let's pray about, you know, healing. Let's... Let's, uh, let's pray right now. And they, they, they kind of won't, they won't go there. Uh, I'm delighted to go there. I'm like, no, 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 please, let's pray right now. Um, but what, yeah, so the pressure isn't on you, isn't on me, because we can't do this. No one can do this, but Jesus can. Uh, so all of the pressure and all of what is, has to be achieved by faith, it's not about me jumping up a mountain. It's about me uh, really trusting that Jesus can jump up a mountain. That's all. Do you believe he can do it? Yeah, of course I believe he can do it. Great. That's all. Just just focus on that. And that's where it starts. That's where it starts. Um, so I, I was taught really powerfully about this by the Lord. Uh, in, I think it was 2017. I was working in a school at the time in, in Derry, uh, St. Bridges College. I was the chaplain and um, felt challenged by God, you know, how can we more effectively bring these kids to know Jesus? And we'd had some, some fruit and brought them on pilgrimages and, and events and doing things in the school or outside of school. And every year we would do a school mission. So a whole pile of, of friars would go in, we'd try and get some nuns to come in with us. And uh, we would be there for about four or five days and we'd give talk, every day we'd give the same talk to each year group. Uh, so you kind of spend the whole day, you whatever, six, six times you give the same talk in the hall and the next day. And one of the days was on healing. But the day before the, the healing day, um, there, was, there was confession time and I got talking to one of the kids. He had fallen arches and he was really hoping, he, he was a great footballer and this kept happening and a lot of injuries and he just, he couldn't play the way he wanted to and he was really hoping that he might, you know, be able to progress and play, not just for fun, but maybe even professionally. So this was a major, major difficult, difficulty for him. So he told me afterwards, I don't remember the full story, but he said, uh, he said that I said to him, I pointed at his feet and said, Jesus wants to heal your feet. I invited him also to come to the healing service that coming Friday and um, invited him to it and that was it. So he went on, I heard his confession, whatever, whatever else happened. The next day, uh, we were having actually a day on healing, talking about healing. And, uh, and he comes in, I see him, I see him coming in and uh, he walks up to me and uh, I'm like, how are you doing? And he goes, oh, golden, Father. I'm like, golden, great. <laughs> what does that mean? He goes, on oh, my feet. I totally forgotten. I'm like, what about your feet? He's like, you know, the, the fallen arches. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. Are, they quite, are you okay? And he goes, oh yeah, I'm brilliant. They're totally fine. I'm, I was at training, I went to training last night and I was running sprints. I'm like, okay. He's like, no, 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 I, I wasn't able to do that. I couldn't, I couldn't run on, on my feet. Like, it was too sore. There's no way I could have done it. I, I'm like, really? I didn't even believe it. So I, I didn't even remember praying with them. Uh, he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, my gosh. This is amazing. So I got his permission. He might have regretted it by the end of the week because I asked if we could share this with other people. We told, he was fine with it. I, we told the whole school. We told every single kid in the main talk which we told six times um, and named him and, and said, yeah, I prayed with him and he was, he was totally healed in order to open these kids up to more faith. That they just might believe, well, this could happen. This, something could happen right now in this healing service. And then after a little talk, we bring around the Blessed Sacrament and just be praying that people get healed. And, 
uh, loads of kids would have, even before that year, we did it previous years, loads of them would have just powerful experiences of God's presence. And uh, they would say that when they would go back to class, because they would seem, you know, Irish kids are no expression. How, how, was that? how did that go, kids? Hmm. <laughs> very, very understated. <laughs> anyway, some of the kids would tell us that when they would get back to their classrooms, and they would, you know, share, you know, oh, yeah, did anyone, I, I felt like, what was that? And the whole class then would share, like, yeah, you felt it too? Yeah, when they brought that thing around, which was Jesus in the monstrance and the Blessed Sacrament. Yeah, they brought that thing and we reached out and touched the, the, ro- the clothy thing. I just felt these tingles go through my body. Did you feel that? Yeah, I've, I felt all dizzy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the whole class of kids. So all these kids were having these amazing experiences. We didn't know about this till sometimes years later. Anyway, um, we were sharing this story about this kid and about him being healed. And, um, and we weren't, nobody was kind of telling us anything was healed. We didn't see anyone get healed. We didn't know what else to do. So it was coming to the end of the day. We still had just the six years the year 13s and 14s um, and uh, so they're all the, you know the seniors the eldest in, in the year, in school and I just kind of wanted more you know again and again I wanted to see I wanted to see miracles happen I wanted to see lives transformed I wanted to see Jesus I want to see heaven and earth go and for these kids to go oh and like our lady another teenage girl who would go oh of course I want this of course you can come into my life and become flesh in me Anyway, so I was there waiting for the six years to come and I was praying to the Lord and, uh, and I was, you know, struggling, like, what more can we do? And I really felt the Lord just quietly in the depths of my heart. I was just imagining him speaking to me and I imagined him saying, uh, would you be willing to look like a fool on the off chance that I would show up? Let me say that again. I felt the Lord say quietly in my heart, just through my imagination, would you be willing to look like a fool on the off chance that I would show up? And meaning, turn up and zap all these kids. And my response was, yes, of course. Now, normally I'm really afraid. <laughs> I struggle with, with fearfulness, especially in, in social situations and anything that's kind of risky about me not looking completely awesome all the time. So, um, when he put it this way, though, I was able to go, yeah, I would, I definitely, I definitely want these, this for these children. I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, what, what, what would we do? So, uh, so then I, I'd heard a couple of talks, uh, you know, different guys who do healing ministry and how they would take little steps of risk. So they would try to listen to the Lord and ask him what he wanted to heal. And if they got a sense, sometimes they'd feel it physically or they'd get an image in their head or they'd feel a word from the Lord, they would then take a risk and they would share it and say, I believe God wants to heal a back because they maybe felt a little warmth in a certain section of the back or a pain, a slight pain in the back or headaches. Maybe they got a flash of a headache. Like, oh, I think that might be from God. And, and they'd share this. And, and what these guys had shared was that when they would take risk, God would do more. And it started to really hit home with me that if I wanted to, to really see God's power get released, I had to make an act of faith. And not faith as some strange, impossible thing that no one can do, but really practically, take a risk, Columba. Take a risk with your reputation. Take a risk that these kids will think, you're a weirdo. Are you willing to look like a fool? That's, that's faith in my book <laughs> for me. That's faith, because I'm really afraid to look like a fool. Uh, and that's okay if you start in that point, but are you willing to possibly look like a fool in order to let God show up? And that's, that, that's the faith. And for me to say yes to that then is, I invite him to come and, and to, to touch down. The image that I had at the time was that I'm like a, a, I'm a big old helicopter landing pad, and the Holy Spirit's this big. A helicopter and he wants to land on the earth but he needs a landing pad and the more risk I will take meaning the more faith actual practical feet on the ground I'm gonna take this risk and it's gonna look terrible if this doesn't happen that kind of risk that that's actually me acting in faith
not just theory, guys. Right? We're good at the theory. We're all say a few prayers for you now. I light a candle for you, but will I actually <laughs> put my not my money where my mouth is, but that could be the risk you're called to. For me, reputation on the line. Can you put your reputation where your mouth is? You know, whatever about your theory, take a risk with something that actually matters to you. Uh, so I was like, yeah, okay. That day in the school, I was like, okay, I'll give it a go. I, I don't know what this means, but sure. So the kids came in, we welcomed them. We were about to start. I was the MC, so I got up ahead of time. And I think we had the talk first, and then, then I was to introduce it, and then uh, one of the other priests would bring the Blessed Sacrament around. And I, that, I took the first risk. I said to the, to the kids, I said, listen, guys, we're going to do a healing service now, and explained it. And I said, I really believe God wants to do something here. And as I had been praying or asking during the talk, what do you want to say? I had a, a vague sense from the Lord again in my imagination, just imagining Jesus talking to me and what might he say? And the, the, the kind of <laughs> imaginary Jesus, which often for me is the way Jesus does speak to me. Um, I had a sense of him, or I imagined him saying, uh, there's kids here struggling with, with reliance on substances, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol. I want to free them. So I shared that. I said, guys, I have a sense. This don't know if this hits home for any of you. I'm like, yeah, all the seniors in the secondary school, yeah, there's probably a few of them. Good, good, good. That it's like you know, I, when when the average age is over 60, there's probably arthritis in in the hall. <laughs> That's a pretty safe bet. So anyway, I, this is what I shared. But I, I really did take a risk with this one. Uh, but I did it gently and not not too crazy. So they didn't, of course, no expression. So I said that, and then I uh, brought the blessed sacrament around. And during that, I was just on my knees and just praying, Lord, is there something else? And, and praying that he release and heal them, any of them who were relying on substances. And, uh, and as I'm sitting there praying and, and just giving God permission, Lord, whatever you, if you want to say something else to me, just say it. And, uh, and I promise to take the risk and say it afterwards. And um, it's kind of cool because we just had a, some thunder just happened outside that's really cool and it's raining loads um, so I'm sitting there you know making this promise to take a risk if God would speak to me and I felt this warmth my shoulders started to get warm in fact I can feel it right now funnily enough this it's just slightly like a degree warmer than the rest of my body I'm like, that's that's really strange but I knew this was sometimes a way that the Holy Spirit can manifest make himself known and then this warmth started to move like this is so weird so it's like oh is it is this a word in, oh, oh my god is this a word of knowledge god and, and then it was like on my shoulders like oh my it's one of the kids got a shoulder problem is that what you're saying to me and then I, I, it started to move and it was like it would go down it went over on you know this shoulder this, then this shoulder then it went down my left arm like to the elbow and then it was back up on the shoulder so it seemed that it wasn't on the right shoulder so much now, it was just on my left. So I'm like, okay, I think, I think maybe it's left. And it would just go up and down the arm. Like, that is so weird. Um, so I'm like, okay, okay. Okay, I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, what if I'm wrong? You know, then I start thinking, oh, what well, if it goes wrong? So I'm like, no, 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 I said I'd do it, so I'm going to do it. And I, I'll do it really gently. All I, know, all I have to say is, say, by any chance, does anyone know? Okay, okay, no problem, right? You can just do that. Plus, I looked like a weirdo anyway, so. Um, so we finished the bringing the Blessed Sacrament around, and then I was the, the MC, so I get up and just kind of say, okay, guys, I hope that was, that was good. You know, this is really Jesus moving around. He loves each of you. Now, just uh, as I mentioned before, just trying to take, take a little step of risk with you all. While I was praying for you all during that service, I felt something unusual just on my left shoulder and arm, did, does anyone have a problem, shoulder and arm, or did anyone feel they were, they were something was healed during the service? And nothing. One of the kids had, a, I think, it was right wrist. You know, he was in a cast. You know, so everyone looks at him. He's like, wrong hand, and it's my wrist. <laughs> he was not having any of this. So, I go, oh. so anyway, nobody says anything. So I'm like, ah, oh, praise God. I felt about this size. I felt so embarrassed. You know, I was hoping you know a kid would jump up and go, oh my goodness, that was me. Oh, and then they'd all start to cry, of course, and then they'd rush the stage, and we'd have to calm them all down. They'd give their life to Jesus. This is my vain imaginations. Nothing. 
nothing. I was mortified. So I'm like, ah, praise God, good opportunity to be humbled. But I'm like, seriously, seriously, God, I took that risk, and you told me to take that risk, and nothing? Okay. I wonder why lots of people don't do this, taking a risk for healing business. So I, I go to the door, and I'm you know, saying goodbye to them. They're leaving, and um, they're all gone. I'm like, oh. <laughs> but they were friendly enough as they were going out, you know, they whatever i look like a weirdo so they're like well yeah he's, a, he's just a weirdo for jesus so it's probably helpful that people realize that especially me and then i get a tap on my shoulder i thought they were all gone and i turn around and one of the kids was behind me and uh, and she says to me um father and she looked really worried about wrong? she goes Can you, it's one of the girls so i went over and they were very very good friends uh close friends and she, she brings me over, and this one of the girls is in floods of tears. I'm like, oh no. My first thought was, these healing services can be very powerful, emotional, they can bring up kind of hurts from the past, or say, you know, if, if a family member died, you know, they can really be powerfully touched, so I figured it might be that. Uh, or something else, you know, something else has come up, or, or she's in pain. And uh, so I really was like, oh my gosh, are you okay? What's wrong? She goes, my arm what about your arm I was like, oh no I was, I was actually really i was really concerned um because one time i prayed with one of the brothers for his back and it got worse <laughs> like he was almost screaming in pain uh so i was thinking oh oh no maybe maybe she's worse and um and i was like are you okay and she goes oh that's it's, uh, and uh, she said, you know, she told me that that morning she has this recurring problem with her shoulder and down her arm, like exactly where that heat was moving. Uh, and that morning she had come and she was in a lot of pain. And she said, you know, her friend who was there said, she had to carry my bag. I couldn't carry my bag. It was really small all day. And I'm like, oh, and is it okay? Again, thinking it's gotten worse. Could you please pray for it now again, Father? And, uh, and she goes, and I asked her, you know, is it, is it okay? And she goes, it's totally fine. And she starts moving it and swinging it and just crying, crying, crying. I'm just like, no. Because I, had, I hadn't, like, I'd, I'd been in situations where I prayed with somebody and then, like, days later, weeks later, someone says, no, I'm fine now. And they're like, oh, it was your prayers. I'm like, no, no, you just recovered. I would always find some excuse or other or put it on God or put it on the other person who was praying, but I'd never actually seen God come through my risk, my act of faith, certainly not by naming it, specific body part, and then that was the one thing that was healed. Um, but, but here it was, in the flesh, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And these kids were rocked. Because they, they, I'd never seen it. they definitely never seen it right there in their arm and it was i just started jumping up and down what do you do when the god of glory shows his glory in a school one of the poorest schools in northern ireland i just started jumping up and down. i was so happy i was so freaked i was so pumped <laughs> um yeah the god the, the power of the resurrection his power which is in you was unleashed that day and some kids were healed, but especially they were opened up to the fact God is real. And in that school, this was normal. This became so normal in school. Kids would come to me or one of the other brothers, Brother Seraphim also worked on. He would pray with kids and kids would get healed all the time. Uh, not all of the staff members, but loads of the staff members would, would come and say, like, oh, Father, I got this thing, would you ever pray? Or me and my husband want to get pregnant, could you pray? Or this stuff was answered all the time. Like I have lists. I was reading a list just the other day, and uh, like multiple staff members and teachers and students, kids with injuries from from football or from from Irish dancing. There was lots of Irish dancing injuries. Terribly, terribly dangerous. Please be careful with your Irish dancing. Um, but a couple of Irish dancers who got healed, and uh, one of the the caretakers, he got he got everything healed. It was amazing. It became normal. But what became normal, most importantly, was taking risk. Was taking risk. And there's never an, a riskless way to take risk, is there? No. 
It's always, you've always got to have something on the line. It's always got to be, I will make some sacrifice so that God can show up. Are you willing to do that? Would you like to see him show up? Would you like to see him show up right now? Because I know right after this talk, we're going into a healing service. And he's, he's a living God. He's a living God, not just in the, the speakers, not just in the big name, not just in so-and-so, you know, sister, mister, father, whoever. He's got an anointing. Say, no. Jesus said in John, is it 14? John 13? I always forget that quote. Uh, the one who believes in me will do the works that I do, and greater works will they do, because I go to my Father. He didn't say, uh, my 12 apostles. Of course, they're included in the one who believes. But do you believe in Jesus? Okay. If you believe that, then, then also believe this word. You don't need to have a gift of healing. You just need to have a gift of obedience. Do you believe? Okay. He said, the ones who believe in me will do the works that I do, which covers many, many things, but also includes healing. And then he said at the end of Mark, he said, you know, these are the signs that will follow, follow believers. And one of them in there is they will lay hands on their sick and, and they will recover. Do you believe? Just believe his word. And it doesn't mean you have to do it by your power. Exactly not. Do you believe that he can do it by his power? Yeah, I believe that. I can, it's safe to believe that, right? And then just, just start there. And then the next step is, do you, do you believe you, would you be willing to take a risk? Would you be willing to say, I, I believe you can do it through me, because I do believe, and you said that, so, so just obey, that's all. I want to give you just some practical points, because I, yeah, because for me, I so felt left out by not being empowered with the power that was in me by the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I always love to not just uh, give a nice talk, but to, to teach, to instruct people, uh, to workshop how, how to actually do this stuff. So I want to give you a couple of practical tips on how to do this. And I found um, <clears throat> sometimes the Lord, he wouldn't heal through me because he wanted to do it through somebody else. And I think sometimes he does this. He doesn't, he doesn't use the, the, the speaker. He doesn't use the famous person, whatever because he wants to use the Mrs. Smith in the front row. He wants to use her. He wants to invite her into a new depth of faith, a new depth of risk-taking. And you tr trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Don't, don't trust me. Don't trust father, sister, whoever. Trust Jesus. Because it's his power in the greatest saint. St. Saint, saint Pio had no power of his own. Our Lady, no power of her own. All the power is him in them. Him in me. Trust Jesus and trust Jesus in you. If you if you don't have any faith for Jesus in you, then you don't have any faith in Jesus. And we might have obstacles because we have a lot of self hatred and a lot of self doubt. Okay, let's let's work with, with Jesus on that stuff. Okay, let's let's repent of that to Jesus. Jesus, I really 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 struggle. You could say to him, for example, I really struggle to believe you could work through me. I believe you could work through Father Colombo or whoever, but to work through me, and I'm really sorry for that, Jesus, because I know that contradicts your word on what you desire to do. Because I do believe in you, and you said the one who believes in me will do the works that I have done, and I've been afraid to do them. I've been afraid to pray with people. I've been afraid to prophecy. I've been afraid to use any of the 20 whatever charismatic gifts there are, uh, because I'm afraid, and I don't, I don't want, I'm afraid to take risk. Just repent of that. And then ask him, okay, Lord, how, how do you want me to start doing this in my life? Healing is just one way. There's infinite, infinite ways to start really walking by the Spirit, which means trust. Walk in such a way that the Spirit is released in the world and the kingdom comes. So I said, uh, often, and you know, sometimes, I would pray with people, they wouldn't get healed because he wanted to heal through somebody else. Um, so some great experiences, like in the school, I prayed with this one girl, she had really bad back nothing would happen. She actually, it wasn't her back. It was, I think, kidney infection and it was ongoing. She was constantly taking medication. I prayed a couple of times and nothing. She was still in pain. She would take medication every day. It was like pain relief. So uh, yeah, I was, was really apologetic. And, uh, and, and just before break, and this is during lunch break, I said, oh, oh, let's have, there's a couple of kids there. Let's, let's have them all pray. They all gathered around. They put hands on her back. They all prayed. I led them in how to pray. Very simple. Um, and, uh, and when we finished, she said, oh, whose hand was there? And she pointed to her back, and one of, the, one of the boys had his hand on a specific place. She said, that hand was roasting. 
So it's one of the boys. He's like, <laughs> anyway, so I'm like, well, how, how's your back? And she's like, she stands up and she tests, it's like totally fine. And since then I checked with her. Um, she hasn't needed, needed the pain medication and she's fine. God didn't do it through me because he wanted to show these kids that the power inside of them is the same power inside of me. It's Jesus. And he, he wants to do the same to you. Um, okay, so very, very simply, what do we need to do? Well, start to make this kind of risk a regular part in your life. Okay, I've given you the, the basics. Jesus told you to do it. It's I, John 14, 12. There you go. You can take a look at it. Um, Jesus himself modeled this. He healed everyone who came to him asking for healing. So go ahead and do that. Um, just keep it really humble and simple. It's not your job to heal. It's Jesus' job. But it is jo- your job to lay hands on the sick and pray with them. Okay? So why just do it? <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not rocket science. Take a, take a risk. Yes, you might look like an Egypt. You might look like... A fool for Jesus. Good. Couldn't be a better person you could be a fool for. Um, yeah, often I'll just say, I'll just keep it simple, just say, well, let's let's pray and see what happens. Because they're all like, oh, will it happen? Won't it happen? It's like, that's up to Jesus. I, but let's pray and see what happens. I'm just going to obey. Um, remember that in these situations, when you pray with somebody or pray with yourself for healing, you get to be God's love in that moment. So even if healing doesn't happen, do the loving thing really, really well. Be really kind and gentle and, and treat them as a person, not as a trophy to be, oh, I'm going to heal this person. It's like, no, this is a child of God to be loved. So love them really well and, uh, and you can't go wrong. So I find out their name, find out the problem. Uh, and when it's appropriate, I might ask them, you know, if I could put my hand on their shoulder because Jesus said, lay your hands on the sick and they will be healed. So I do. Um, then I might ask, sometimes I might ask God, uh, you know, what's the cause? Is, is it like emotional, spiritual, demonic, or physical? You know, sometimes uh, that can be helpful if he gives you a sense on that. Sometimes he wants to share a, a, a prophetic word, a word of encouragement or love or comfort for them that can help open up their faith. Sometimes he might give you a word of knowledge. Uh, that's happened to me often where I feel a sensation in my body and I have a, oh, they've asked for prayer for this, but do you have something wrong with, behind your right ear? Is there something going on there? And then they realize, oh my goodness, this is even before you pray for healing, they, their faith goes through the roof because they realize, wow, this is real. How did you know that I've got a problem behind my ear? Um, so I ask God the cause uh, and just take a little listen. It's not always clear for me uh, what, what the cause is, but I'll ask, I'll ask him. Uh, then I ask, uh, then, yeah, then really simply I pray. Okay, <laughs> really simple. I, I thank God for the person. I bless God for the person. I bless them. I invite the Holy Spirit. I usually will, if they're Catholic and comfortable, I'll be invoking Our Lady and the Saints. And if they're not Catholic and comfortable, I'll do that <laughs> in, my, in my heart, in my spirit. Um, and uh, I'll bless them, invite the Holy Spirit. Then I speak very briefly and directly to the, to the condition. Uh, so headache, in Jesus' name, I command you to leave. Um, eyes, be healed. Eyes come into focus in Jesus' name. Muscles. And for me, I like to know kind of details about conditions or eyes and stuff so I can speak to, you know, ligaments and muscles and tendons. You know, I, I like that thing. I find it, it helps my faith. So you can do that stuff. But really, the, the, the thing is engaging your faith and inviting Jesus to do what he does. And, and speaking in his name, which means, you know, you, you, in, you speak to the, the condition. You don't have to say or you could do. You say, Jesus, could you heal this? But... I, uh, I find it sometimes more direct and more risky to you speak to it in his name, which is the same thing as asking him to do it. Um, so I pray, I bless them, invite the Holy Spirit, I speak to the condition briefly, and then I'm assessing. Okay, so after that I assess. So I'm, I've got my eyes open as I'm praying with them, because sometimes when you pray, you'll see them react. You'll see like, ooh, they moved or they... So I'll ask them, well, what, something happened there? Are you okay? What, what, what happened? What's going on? What are you feeling? What did you feel as we prayed? You felt something. So, you know, was there a warmth? Was there a tingle? Was there a peace? Was there, was, did, did, did the pain get worse? Did it move? Um, so the stuff like that is very, very important. So I've got my eyes open. I'm asking them questions. If there's any improvement uh, or any sensation, I will celebrate that. I will thank God for that. And I will invite them to thank God for that. I get them to thank Jesus. Um, then I'll listen again to the Holy Spirit, as I mentioned already. It's like, hey, what are you doing? Is there any other clarity about the cause here? Anything else you want me to go after? Any prophetic word, any sense? And I'll, I might briefly touch on that and then go back into, I'll ask him, okay, can we pray again? So let's say the pain went from, you know, a, a 10 down to a five. 
like, oh, I'll celebrate that. And I'll say, let's pray again. Jesus wants to completely heal this. And we pray again. And it's just the same thing. Just in Jesus' name, pain, go completely right now. And uh, thank God, assess, ask, celebrate. Uh, so I'll just keep going. I won't, won't go all day, but I'll keep going so long as they're willing, as long as God seems to be doing something. And, um, and then you want to be keeping an eye out for, you know, is God done? Is God finished here? There's no more shift. There's no more transformation. You're not sensing any more to say to them. Or they're done. Sometimes they're just, they can't handle it and they need to. So just be, uh, keep an eye on that and, and, and be attentive to them for that. Um, then just affirm them, encourage them. You know, say, yes, Jesus loves you. Sometimes people can feel bad or it's their fault because they didn't get healed. But no, just affirm them, encourage them. Affirm them that God loves them no matter what. And, and just pray for, during the whole thing. I'll be praying just for them to encounter and experience God. Often that's the biggie. It's not even the healing. It's just they're like, whoa, they feel God's presence. They feel the Holy Spirit's heaviness come on them. They're like, what is that? They've never experienced it in their life. You're, you're bringing this, this incredible moment of contact between those two worlds, regardless of whether healing is the way God wants to, to release himself. And often then coming out of that, I will invite them into a relationship with Jesus. Would you like to invite Jesus into your life? The Jesus who just heals you or just you just experienced. He wants to do that with your whole life. Would you like to invite him? And I'll leave them in a very, very simple prayer of faith and inviting Jesus into their heart and surrendering, the, repenting of their sins. I, with that, it's, it's also good then to, if, if there's a possibility of this, to connect them with their parish or yourself to, to continue to connect with them. Again, if that's possible, uh, to, to teach them more about their faith, to teach them more about themselves, stepping out in, in the Lord, in the Holy Spirit, in prayer, establishing a, you know, a, a solid prayer life and spiritual life. Um, yeah, be attentive. You might get some words of knowledge. Great. If, it, if you get those things, you know, I'd really encourage you to share them. Just take a risk. You get a sensation in your body. Um, and with all of this, don't just do this like two times or 20 times. You know, do it 200 times. Take some risk. Make risk a normal part of your life, brothers and sisters. He wants to show up. The God who had loved you and saved you at the cross and right now is, is saving you and transforming you. He wants to do that for everybody that you meet just by you being you and carrying him and releasing him wherever you go. So I really, really encourage you, brothers and sisters, you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. And I want to pray now uh, in Jesus' name that any gift that he's ever given me of, of prayer, of healing, of word of knowledge, of, of love for him, of faith, of, of risk-taking, that you'd receive that grace. If you want to receive this, now just open your heart, open your hands, close your eyes and see what God will send you. Holy Spirit, come, bless my brothers and sisters. Bless this time now of healing. And I pray you'd release gifts, signs and wonders into their life and faith for that, that they will be excited and willing to take risk for you and for your kingdom. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.